Hello, welcome to another episode of the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition's Coalition Forum. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm your host, David Dedekian, a small business owner here in Rhode Island. I own Eat Drink Rhode Island. And uh, we've got another fantastic uh, candidate guest with you, with us here today for us to speak with. Uh, thank you very much to Ashley Kalis for joining us. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is really great. I've uh, always been a small business owner myself, so it's really great that you're doing this. No, thank you. Thank you. For, for those of you out there who may not know, though, you can see on our background, Ashley's running for governor uh, on, the, on the Republican ticket. And uh, I'll, just a quick reminder to all of you out there watching, Tuesday, November 8th is the general election. So make sure you go out there and vote on Tuesday, November 8th. So Ashley, why don't we, uh, why don't we start? Why don't you give, give everyone a, a brief overview of, of yourself and your campaign? Yeah, so I'll tell you about myself. So I am a mom of three school age boys, um, and I'm also uh, a small business owner. I have been. I've stepped away, which is always sort of a weird experience because right. um, owning small businesses, you're you just it's just the weirdest thing ever. I've never been able to go on vacation and actually leave. Like, uh, and um, it's sort of strange. Uh, I worked in uh, the healthcare uh, industry. I uh, built a medical practice and then vertically integrated, had an operating room and then uh, had the other specialties around it uh, integrated into the larger practice and then had uh, one of the largest regional uh, specialty practices. So grew it from a business that didn't have any employees to uh, one that was really large. And it was a really, um, it's a really unique experience. And I think uh, you're a different type of leader if you build, you know, if you uh, build a business, grow that business, and then help others achieve in uh, their success. I think you really understand what it's like to be a small business owner and what it feels like to interact uh, with customers, employees, and the government at the same time. Yeah. I um, understand in a um, in a way that is like a business owner what. Um, how policy will actually impact my day to day. And I think that's valuable having a governor who um, can see the idea, see the vision, and then understand like what that will look like um, in Rhode Island. And, you know, we are a small business state. So having right, somebody yeah. that is a voice that also understands that in an immediate way, I wasn't a small business owner, you know, 30 years ago, I had to step away from my responsibilities in the last year uh, to run for governor. So um, I know what it's like in the new world of, you know, trying to manage a website, trying to deal with CRMs, this whole uh, new world of, of being a small business owner and trying to make everything work. Oh, lots of stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I've had my business for oh, about 25 years and uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing the, the, the amount of changes we've seen in that amount of time. It's truly really incredible, impressive uh, in the same way. Um, it, you know, it's fascinating. A lot of the candidates we've spoken to uh, this year. Um, our small business owners or were small business owners. Uh, I think it's part of that entrepreneurial spirit that, that drives people to run for office as well. Don't you, don't you think that there's some of that? Yeah, there? I think, I think so. Um, I think it's also an understanding of um, how uh, government can interact with business in a productive or not productive way and how uh, policy can uh, make a difference in terms of the economy and also other things like education. Like I take it from, it's a civil rights issue, but it's also an economic issue. And as a business owner, uh, when I had uh, operating rooms, I was always at the technical uh, training um, schools waiting until surgical technologists graduated and trying to recruit them before they were even gone so that I could attract uh, that talent. And it was a real challenge for me. That was one of the biggest challenges that I had is I had, um, you know, having, um, a workforce that was ready to work and had yeah. the very specific skill set that I needed. Well, why don't we start there? Because that's that's obviously a hot a hot topic right now is workforce and workforce development and the and the lack of even though we've got this record low unemployment, uh, the lack of people out there to to work a lot of these jobs. It's it's a, it's a struggle for a lot of small business owners. Uh, you know, in in my small sector of small business. Uh, you know, food and drink. I hear about it every day from people, but I know other industries as well are impacted. Uh, what are your thoughts there? And what do you, what do you think can be done there uh, at the state level? So there are a few different things. One is matching um, skills. So what we need to do is we need to focus on our education system. And for businesses, I think having a version of Davies, which is a technical training uh, school that um, it's a high school and it uh, is academic excellence, excellence plus real world skills. So having that in each county would be something that we should invest in. It would be great uh, for businesses and it would provide a workforce that's ready to work and also high paying jobs. Um, they're finding that um, way to interact with the education system would be very helpful for employers. Also, affordability is a 
personal issue, but it's also a business issue is if right. you cannot find housing for employees, if um, it is not affordable um, to, you know, to live in this state, you can't recruit a workforce and you can't uh, retain them. I've had employees move to other states because they just have a better quality of life because it's more affordable. And those are sort of macroeconomic issues that really the government could help with and they could help small businesses. As a small business, you can't really um, make, you know, by yourself deal with an affordable housing crisis, but the government can help. And that'll in turn help small businesses be able to attract and retain talent. Absolutely. You know, it, it's fascinating. You know, we, we've touched on this many times here uh, in, in the interviews I've talked to and, and some of the uh, 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 appointed officials that I've talked to, you know, we talk about small business, but it really does, you know, you brought up education and housing already. All these things really do feed into how uh, how small business works and, and thrives here in Rhode Island. The other big one uh, is that we, we brought up many times here, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, is infrastructure. Yep. Uh, so infrastructure, child care would be another one that is always on, on my mind. Yeah, we could talk about that as well. I mean, and so when we think about infrastructure, and I also want to tie that into economic development and economic development programs. So what we, what a government invest in and how invested money um, really impacts uh, business. The role of the government really should be investing um, in economic development projects where everybody can benefit, where you're not picking winning or losing firms, but instead creating the infrastructure, whether it be educational infrastructure or roads, um, to uh, ensure that businesses can then all use that collectively to grow. And so what we really need, and I think with small um, businesses in particular, is if we have a government that is able to deliver those services um, well, make sure that, I mean, listen, I was held to my contracts. A contract is a promise. And making sure that um, government is operated in a professional manner that uh, expects results, um, has a clear and transparent uh, contracting process uh, is really, really important. Um, we need to invest in infrastructure. We have money. This is the incredible thing. Like as, um, yeah. as a business person, I'm like, we have political will and money. Like you never get those things together. And so what you need, with we have that. Now you need a leader who's going to uh, deliver results and make sure that we do not uh, waste this money. And uh, for me, uh, it's very important to have somebody who isn't beholden to special interests, um, that is able to be a competent administrator and really an honest broker for the people of Rhode Island. Uh, small businesses just, you know, just want that. It's just like deliver results for us so that we can grow. Yeah, no, very true. Uh, so you mentioned uh, not being beholden. And, uh, you know, this is your first time running for office? It is right. my first time running for office. Yeah. So uh, explain to us a little bit about your background. Uh, obviously, running a small business, we know uh, as business owners, but for people out there who aren't, aren't, aren't uh, business owners themselves that are watching this, uh, leadership is key. Uh, explain to us your background there and, and, and what your role was and how you, you know, how you developed your business, you know, to, to get to the where you were uh, just yeah. a little while ago before you had to leave it. <laughs> Like everything in, in business, you you start out trying to see what will make it work. And the reality was that, um, I, so it started off as a medical practice. We were doing uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery, uh, providing patient care. And um, we you know worked to develop relationships with other physicians. And then we also went out and got our patients ourselves. So we grew the uh, organization um, from a very small one to a very large one. And then, um, but through that process, I did everything from answering the phones to managing a staff to also like starting on our first website, learning all about pay-per-click and all of those things. You know, at the time it was websites and then it became social media. So I went through that entire process and was able to, um, you know, really build that. And in business, you know, you can have vision, um, but if you don't have substance and you're broke. And so having a business, you know, person that understands like you can have all the vision in the world, but if you can't get it done, it really doesn't matter. Um, that perspective, I think really will help um, in the governor's office now. And I just frankly don't see um, anyone else who has had to uh, get in the mix in the same sort of way that I have and has for the demonstrated uh, record of success. I, you know, in under 10 years, I built one of the, the largest practices was ver vertically integrated. Then I got into the COVID response in the middle of a national uh, crisis and had contracts around the country. So I went in service and was able to really do um, big things um, quickly and uh, help out. And so I just, uh, I think that level of business success, the grit, the determination, um, the, hey, we need to deliver results mentality will really help. And quite frankly, um, being, being all in and um, 
which means also not, when I say not being beholden, it means that you're elected by uh, the people of Rhode Island. And the, the idea that um, campaign donations or financing um, doesn't influence you is just not true. I just don't believe that that's true. So with me, you get someone who is mostly uh, self-finance. And I don't feel that I owe anything to anyone um, in terms of what, what they've done. I just am here to help Rhode Island. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about uh, your connection to Rhode Island. Obviously, uh, you know, I read your bio. You, you grew up here. Uh, you had to you had to move away, uh, as many of us have. I, I moved away for quite a while myself, uh, came back. Uh, how's your, what, what's your thoughts there? What, what you know, what drove you to have to leave and then what drove you to, yeah. co to come back? Uh, I mean, we I really wanted to be here and leaving. Um, I'm sort of the you know, what they call about the brain drain or the biggest exports is our kids. That was me. And yeah. I was not happy about leaving. Um, I was never happy being away. And um, I had to make a personal decision because I had a very successful business. And um, it is really hard when you build something um, to say like, okay, that's enough. And then going, you know, go back to where you want to go. And so that is what uh, I've done. So I built a successful business elsewhere because there was economic opportunity. And the, the reality is I didn't come from anything. So we looked at a whole bunch of, um, of student debt. Um, we, it was, you know, 2009 ish era where there was 10% unemployment in Rhode Island. The economy wasn't great. And we just didn't think that we could make it here in medicine. We were ranked, uh, the worst state for doctors to practice in right now. So it wasn't great then it's very bad. Now the decision was one about, um, survival for us economically. And we wanted to have a family. Um, and so we left, but I was able to come back. And when I came back, the same problems that made us have to leave were still here. And the issue is that we are, um, we're a state with big problems, but these problems are solvable. It is a matter of political will and leadership. And that's why I'm running is, is I really believe that we can solve these problems with the economy um, and also with the education system. And if we do that, then um, my kids won't, I won't have to, you know, want my kids to live by me, but feel like they might be giving something up in terms of opportunity um, or a better life. I mean, that's why um, that's why I work so hard is to create a good life for my children. Um, sure. And I don't I want them to be able to stay in Rhode Island and still um, be able to, you know, meet their potential. Um, and I just am afraid um, that that might not be the case if we don't have a change in leadership. Understandable. Understandable. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, as a parent myself, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think also to your credit, uh, you know, being a parent is also a form of leadership and running a small business <laughs> for many days. Um, yeah. I've been a working mom. I mean, that is, I had three children. I should talk about that. So I, um, you know, my background, so I, um, my background educationally is in public policy and like a lot of individuals that, uh, go into small business, I didn't really, um, use that degree. It was great. It informed me a lot, but economic Same. policy and security policy. Um, and uh, also in the process of building that business, I had uh, three children. So I have a 12 year old, a 10 year old and a seven year old. So if you can imagine, I, um, in my last year of graduate school, I was pregnant, had a baby in March, still graduated in, in May. Um, Cause I was afraid if I took time off, I would never go back. Um, and had and you know, an infant while trying to um, build a business. So sometimes if I didn't have daycare, my um, baby came to work with me, put right. him in an exam room and we'd switch off and we'd see the patients. And I think that made me more empathetic and also a different leader in business because I've always been, I, I know what my experience uh, was and I've been very supportive um, in my own organizations of women, especially women with children and trying to make it work. I know what that feeling is. I'm still doing it. Um, you know, it's, you know, at the end of summer, it's always hard when summer camp ends and, you know, and then school hasn't begun. Like I'm still sort of in the middle of, um, of it all with young kids. No, I completely understand. I, uh, my, my wife's full-time school teacher. So it was always kind of left on the guy that, you know, could make his own hours sort of thing and do his own thing and, you know, be the boss. Uh, I realize I'm completely in the minority there. I know it's majorly women that are, you know, have that burden and that, that focus. Uh, and it does, you know, as we learned through the pandemic, it does wear uh, the women in workforce, you know, down, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, oh, it'll, hurt, it'll hurt women in the long run. I mean, that's what we don't talk about a lot, which is um, the gap 
uh, that was caused for a lot of women in the workforce during the pandemic is because it was just uneven not knowing um, when school would occur or having that instability made it very, very difficult to have a job um, and also uh, be a parent. Um, and I had to, uh, you know, in getting involved in the pandemic response, I've always been a working parent, um, but I made some decisions about, um, you know, who I was helping and and my overall goal to uh, help and service in, in the medical um, world where I frankly, you know, had to leave my kids and when they needed me the most during remote learning and um, they didn't do very well. I still feel you know, badly about it, but it was a decision that I had to make and I was torn either go to work or help my kids. And I had to go to work. Right. Yeah. Cause if you didn't make the money, that's not going to help them either. I mean, you know, that's the reality yeah. of living here and being part of a, you know, owning your own business. And we all thought it would be short too. We're like, you'll be, I was like, I think they will be okay for a month. And then a month, you know, it just, yeah. it was one of those things where you're trying to make the right decisions and you know, it's, it's been tough. And I think we, um, when you look at workforce participation, um, you know, underemployment and sort of the challenges in getting the economy moving again, I don't think we should underestimate how um, COVID and those policies impacted women and, and may have an impact on um, women going forward because there may be that gap. And that gap um, in terms of pay experience can last. We have an obligation to address that. Yeah, good point. Excellent point. Okay, so you came back to Rhode Island. Uh, what, where, where'd you move back to? We moved back to Newport. Um, it was I. Um, it was a compromise. I like you know like everything in a marriage. I um I really loved uh, Tiverton. My husband is from the Bronx originally, and we fell in love in Providence, and he wanted to move back. So Newport is uh, sort of a, a nice mix of being really close to the beach, um, and um, still having you know. Uh, sort of that liveliness of of a city as well. Right. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Uh, so you, you mentioned it earlier. Let, let, let's try and address some of the things you said. You know that were kind of a hindrance on your on your business growing here. Um, you know, we all see it. All the small business owners see things. You know, we could list for days. You know, unfortunately, some of the things that keep us from growing our businesses and things of that nature. What specifics uh, in in your field uh, did you feel were a problem? What What do you think you can address as governor? Yeah, I think what we can do, so let's talk about specific solutions. So we should have a small business council, and what that needs to do is uh, we need the input of businesses in terms of uh, regulations, things that things that make it hard to do business. So instead of complaining for days, let's have a place where we, you know, tackle the problems and try to solve the problems. Also, we should look and track fines for me. Um I believe that most businesses, um, especially small businesses, want to be compliant. So if you have fines or other things where a business isn't um, compliant, if you see a pattern, it's usually an issue of um, education and outreach that needs to be addressed and um, or um, a regulation that just doesn't make a lot of sense. So rather than seeing um, fines and fees as a source of revenue, I think it should be seen as sort of an indicator that maybe there's something wrong that needs to be addressed. I think that we need to have a service center uh, for businesses. You should not have to go to multiple different places in order to get all the information that is, um, I wouldn't say it's unique to Rhode Island, but um, I've done business in other states. I think that's an advantage. I've done business in multiple other states, so I have different reference points for what works well and what doesn't. And the reality is we can consolidate that. So if you can call um, one place um, to do that, that would be very helpful for business owners to get all your questions answered. Um, our, um, in the lieutenant governor ticket um, on the Republican side, I have a commitment from that individual that uh, if he's elected, that he will use that office to create the service center, which is also makes it revenue neutral, which is important to me that we have a way to pay for things um, as well, rather than just saying we're going to do things. Um, the other thing is mentoring programs. Um, in business, it's... Um, a process of learning what works and what doesn't, but sometimes if someone can show you the way um, or not make it so that everything you learn is a is a process of oh that didn't work, you know, it would be helpful. To, it's helpful to have a mentor, or if something doesn't work, asking someone who's been through it before, like what do you think is going on, is really helpful. Um, so I think that that would help. I've talked about investing in technical education. Um, I that was a struggle for my growth is the inability to find. Um, specific uh, members of my team. For me, it was surgical technologists. It was always a challenge because um, it's such a specific skill set. And so if, um, and I could have hired as many as could have been produced, I can't even think, but it actually so that I 
couldn't open additional operating rooms because I didn't staff them. And sure. um, we need technical training programs that meet um, the workforce needs. And these are really high paying jobs. Like that's a very, it's, um, it's a job that, um, you know, can pay almost hundred thousand dollars a year. And um, I just couldn't find people um, to do that job. So that's it. And then also lowering taxes. Um, we could do the sales tax, but really um, looking at the overall tax burden and making sure that we're regionally competitive. What we can't do is take the only um, competitive tax in which, you know, the corporate tax and make ourselves uncompetitive in that, in that way as well. Um, but I think really just looking at, it's not a specific tax because um, at the end of the day, it's just, how much am I paying in fees and taxes um, that yeah. really generally matters to someone, not which one. It's just like overall, where am I at the end of the day? So right. we need to do that to be competitive. Um, the other thing is um, that I did notice here is that the electricity costs are just um, brutal. Yeah. <laughs> They're really bad in Rhode Island, um, like very shockingly high. And I do a business interest in other states and it really does not make a lot of sense. So in the short term, we need to provide immediate relief because we are looking at increase in electricity costs and we can't uh, push businesses that are already on the brink because everything is more expensive over the edge. So immediate relief, you know, looks like reducing, um, you know, the tax on electricity that helps um, just to provide a, a, a way for us to get by or for businesses to get by when things are very high. And then we need to look at the long term solution to that because our, our costs are just higher than other places. So whether right. it's investing in the infrastructure so that we don't have that issue um, or really having a serious conversation about like why, you know, it's like 30 percent higher um, for businesses and then 90 percent higher for um, industrial businesses, which is just um, it doesn't make sense. Um, that the rates are so high. And that is going to, in the long term, impact our our growth. But we do need immediate relief because, you know, the whole, um, and this is a very um, coming from business, the whole I'm going to study it for two years approach um, is not something that I've ever had the luxury of doing. Like, that's shocking to me that, you know, and you just, I also think that um, that perspective of we're not doing studies to do studies. We're doing studies to find solutions, and we need to get there very quickly. Um, I think will make a huge difference in this state because um, I don't want a 200-page study that doesn't result in something that we can do to help people immediately. And that study can't take forever. And yeah. I see a lot of that going on here. Um, and just with me as governor, that that'll stop because that just I wouldn't have been able to survive in business. So it's a little bit shocking to me that. Um, Delaying is um, a mechanism of not providing help. And, um, you know, it just businesses don't work that way. Yeah, no, And government very- doesn't need to either. And, you know, government is different than business, but there are some things that we can do to make it so the government is more responsive. And, yes, you need to do studies, um, but how long they take, how much they cost, and what they deliver at the end, um, if you take more of a business approach, uh, I think that that will actually benefit the state. Yeah, that's a very interesting perspective. I, I I don't don't disagree with you there that the 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 number of studies in length is is really something. something yeah, I read them all the time for policy. I'm like, okay, well, what do we do? Like, we spent yeah. like how much money was spent on that? You know, it's just um, you know, and I think we can we can come up with solutions yeah. um in a timely manner. Yeah. So let's address uh, since you you have a very uh specific area of, of knowledge and expertise that some of the other candidates don't have uh, in regards to healthcare. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts about healthcare as governor? What, what, you know, it's, it, uh, there's lots of layers to it. It's a huge problem. So we yeah, can't I know. Rest it it in a few which part of healthcare do we yeah. want to talk about rebalancing uh, yeah. long-term care? Or, um, so, you know, uh, we, so there's a whole, I mean, first off, medical practices are small businesses most of the time, and if yeah. they're independently owned. And so they act like small businesses and um, are very important to the community. Uh, one of the things that we need to do in healthcare in Rhode Island in particular, I was very against the merger because it reduced options and competition, um, which means that it reduced oh, option for healthcare work. Remind our, uh, our viewers, you're talking about the merger between the two hospital units. Uh, the, uh, Correct. And that didn't happen. Right. Um, but I think we should talk about it just generally because philosophically in terms of sure. who the candidate did support it or didn't take a position, I guess. And, and that's something that should have been, that is a very clear economic position and healthcare position to take. I was against it because it reduced options for healthcare workers and also reduced competition, which does increase price because then you would have the... Uh, 
effectively an, a monopoly. And so what we should work to do is we should work to have a better healthcare environment. We shouldn't be ranked worst to practice medicine in, in, in the country. Part of it is those issues with affordability that we need to address that are sort of systemic reasons that our economy is sort of stagnated and, and we have problems. But other things have to do with um, regulation. We could have compact licensing so that um, you know nurses can sort of move around and, and um, it's not so hard to get licensed here in Rhode Island. That's the standard. Also, um, we should encourage um, more healthcare organizations to be here so the patients have choices um, and it reduces costs. So I'll give you a very specific regulation. Certificate of need regulation, uh, I do not support. What that is, is, and we have that in Rhode Island, um, a lot of states are moving away from that. Um, what that is, is um, let's say that you want to open a surgical uh, center. I'm just giving a, an example. And you're not able to just open one. You have to basically do the equivalent of asking your competitor and the government whether you should be able to open that business, whether they need you. I mean, what do you think your competitor is going to say? Yeah, we'd love to have you here. They're going to say like, no, we're good. We're good. And so that um, that came from the philosophy in healthcare um, that healthcare, it came from an old time that healthcare was like a, uh, something that was like a utility market and it's not anymore. So moving the idea from a regulatory standpoint of what healthcare is now, um, moving the state to that place will increase competition, but making sure that, you know, you don't have regulations, that there's housing, um, and that there's competition that, uh, physicians feel that they can start medical practices and be successful independently. Um, that's really, really important. Also, raising uh, Medicaid rates, that actually helps independent physicians, and then it helps everyone. If you're helping independent physicians, which are the small businesses, the most vulnerable businesses, you're helping the entire healthcare industry. That's why I focus on, on um, those small businesses is because in, in any small business, if you're helping a small business, you're helping everyone. No, especially here in Rhode Island. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, it's really the backbone. If you took all the small businesses together, it's, a, it's the largest sector of, of the economy. Yeah, we're small. We're a small business state, and we should be proud of that because that makes us innovative. Um, it's just a great thing to be. I think that um, small business is the best business. Entrepreneurs are great, um, and as a state, we should be proud of that as our identity, and we should support it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I, I think my, my last question. Uh, you know, obviously, we've got a very democratic uh, general assembly, and and I certainly don't think that uh, the state of Rhode Island or any state, really, for that matter, see the the divisiveness and, and, and infighting that there is in, in Washington, D.C. But as a uh, Republican governor, how do you feel uh, working within our system here in Rhode Island? What, what are your thoughts there? I will work. I mean, this is like this. I'll work with anybody who wants to work on the issues uh, together. And I plan to work um across, I mean, across parties that just, that has to happen in order to get things done. I, um, what you will see in me is somebody that is more interested in making a difference than making a point. And so that means that I, you know, I, when I'm elected governor, the, you know, when the campaigns are over, I will um, come in good faith as a partner to solve issues of the economy and education. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, I will work with you because um, we need to work together. These are not issues of party. They're issues of the future of our state. And I also think that a two party system is healthy. Um, it creates pressure for change. It's like in business, like if you're negotiating against yourself, you're, you're, you're not going to get you know to a good place. But having someone else um, is really helpful. And I think it'll be helpful to this state to have different ideas, different leadership so that we can get together collaboratively uh, to better solutions. Thank you for that. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say in closing before we, uh, before we wrap up? No, thank you for supporting small businesses. I really appreciate it. Um, I thank you so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you for being on the show today. We appreciate the interview. This is a great conversation. Reminder again, uh, Tuesday, November 8th is the election, though you can start voting early uh, in just about everywhere in the state now. Uh, you can vote now. So uh, keep that in mind if you, if you do want to vote early. Uh, but Tuesday, November 8th is the general election. Ashley Kalis, thank you very much for being here and uh, good luck with the campaign. Thank you so much. So that's another episode. Uh, as always, you can find more information on the Small Business Coalition at risbc.org. Sign up for the newsletter. It's a free membership for everyone. And then we have tiers with our portal that is opening any any second now, literally. Uh, risbc.org. Thank you to Ben to uh, putting that up there on the screen. And we'll see you at the next show. Take care. <laughs>